TCP is a reliable layer four protocol. TCP uses a three-way handshake to create reliable connections across the network. TCP can reorder segments that arrive out of order and retransmit missing segments. UDP is a simpler and faster cousin to TCP. UDP is commonly used for applications that are lossy or can handle some packet loss, such as streaming audio and video. It is also used for query response applications, such as DNS queries. Secure Shell, or SSH, was designed as a secure replacement for Telnet, FTP, and the Unix R commands. It provides confidentiality, integrity, and secure authentication, among other features. SSH includes SFTP and SCP for transferring files. SSH can also be used to securely tunnel other protocols, such as HTTP. SSH servers listen on TCP port 22 by default. FTP is the file transfer protocol used to transfer files to and from servers. Like Telnet, FTP has no confidentiality or integrity and should not be used to transfer sensitive data over insecure channels. FTP uses two ports. The control connection, where commands are sent, is TCP port 21. Active FTP uses a data connection, where data is transferred that originates from TCP port 20. DNS is the domain name system, a distributed global database that translates names to IP addresses and vice versa. DNS uses both TCP and UDP. Small responses use UDP port 53, while large responses, including zone transfers, use TCP port 53. The TCP IP model is a popular network model created by DARPA in the 1970s. TCP IP is an informal name named after the first two protocols created. The formal name is the Internet Protocol Suite. The TCP IP model is simpler than the OSI model. While TCP and IP receive top billing, TCP IP is actually a suite of protocols including UDP and ICMP, among many others. The Internet layer of the TCP IP model aligns with Layer 3, or the network layer of the OSI model. This is where IP addresses and routing live. When data is transmitted from a node to one LAN to a node on a different LAN, the internet layer is used. IP version 4, IP version 6, ICMP, and routing protocols, among others, are internet layer TCP IP protocols. IP version 6 is the successor to IP version 4, featuring far larger address space, simpler routing, and simpler address assignment. A lack of IP version 4 addresses was the primary factor that led to the creation of IP version 6. The most modern systems now are dual stack and use both IP version 4 and IP version 6 simultaneously. Hosts may also access IP version 6 networks via IP version 4. This is called tunneling. Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, is a helper protocol that assists layer 3. ICMP is used to troubleshoot and report error conditions. Without ICMP to help, IP would fail when faced with routing loops, ports, hosts, or networks that are down. ICMP has no concept of ports as TCP and UDP do, but instead uses types and codes. Telnet provides terminal emulation over a network. Terminal means text-based VT100 style terminal access. Telnet servers listen on TCP port 23. Telnet was the standard way to access an interactive command shell over a network for over 20 years. Telnet is weak because it provides no confidentiality. All data transmitted during a Telnet session is plain text, including the username and password used to authenticate the system. The network access layer of the TCP IP model combines layer one and layer two of the OSI model. It describes layer one issues such as energy bits and the medium used to carry them, copper fire, wireless, etc. It also describes layer two issues like converting bits into protocol units such as Ethernet frames, MAC addresses, and network interface cards. IPv4 is Internet Protocol version 4, commonly called just IP. It is a simple protocol designed to carry data across networks. It is so simple that it requires a helper protocol called ICMP. IP is connectionless and unreliable. It provides best effort delivery of packets. If connections or reliability are required, they must be provided by a higher level protocol carried by IP such as TCP.
IP version 4 uses 32-bit source and destination addresses usually shown in dotted quad format, such as 192.168.2.4. A 32-bit address field allows 2 to the 32nd, or nearly 4.3 billion addresses. TCP connects from a source port to a destination port, such as from source port 51178 to destination port 22. The TCP port field is 16 bits, allowing port numbers from 0 to 65,535. There are two types of ports, reserved and ephemeral. A reserved port is 1,023 or lower. Ephemeral ports are from 1,024 to 65,535. Most operating systems require super user privileges to be able to open a reserved port. Any user may open an unused ephemeral port. A MAC address is the unique hardware address of an Ethernet NIC typically burned in at the factory. MAC addresses may be changed in software. Historically, MAC addresses were 48 bits long. The first 24 bits form the organizationally unique identifier, also known as the OUI, and the last 24 bits form a serial number, formerly called an extension identifier. The IEEE created the EUI 64 also known as the Extended Unique Identifier for standard 64-bit MAC addresses. The OUI is still 24 bits, but the serial number is 40 bits. This allows for far more MAC addresses compared to the 48-bit addresses. IP version 6 auto configuration is compatible with both these types of MAC addresses. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, transfers unencrypted web-based data. HTTPS, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, transfers encrypted web-based data via SSL TLS. HTTP uses TCP port 80, and HTTPS uses TCP port 443. HTML, or Hypertext Markup Language, is used to display web content. The host-to-host -host transport layer, or more commonly called simply the transport layer, connects the internet layer to the application layer. It is where applications are addressed on a network via ports. TCP and UDP are the two transport layer protocols used in TCP IP. A bus network topology connects each system to a trunk or backbone cable. All systems on the bus can transmit data simultaneously, which can result in collisions. A collision occurs when two systems transmit data at the same time. The signals interfere with each other. Ethernet is an example of a bus network. The TCP IP application layer combines the session, presentation, and application layers of the OSI model. Most of these protocols use a client-server architecture where a client connects to a listening server, such as SSHD. The clients and servers use either TCP or UDP, or sometimes both, as a transport layer protocol. TCP IP application layer protocols include Secure Shell, Telnet, FTP, and many others. SMTP is the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is used to transfer email between servers. SMTP servers listen on TCP port 25. PLP version 3, also known as Post Office Protocol, and IMAP, also known as Internet Message Access Protocol, are used for client-server email access, which use TCP ports 110 and 143, respectively. So next, let's go over standard network topologies. A star network topology employs a centralized connection device. It can simply be a hub or switch. Each system is connected to the central hub by a dedicated segment. A mesh network topology connects systems to all other systems using numerous paths. A partial mesh topology connects many systems to many other systems. A mesh network topology provides redundant connections to systems, allowing multiple segment failures without seriously affecting connectivity. A ring network topology connects each system as points on a circle. The connection medium acts as a unidirectional transmission loop. Only one system can transmit data at a time. Traffic management is performed by a token. A multitude of protocols exist at the TCP IP application layer, which combines the session, presentation, and application layers of the OSI model. The OSI model, or the Open Systems Interconnection model, is a conceptual framework used to describe the functions of a networking system. 
The OSI model characterizes computing functions into a universal set of rules and requirements in order to support interoperability between different products and the software. In the OSI reference model, the communications between a computer system are split into seven different abstraction layers. These layers include the physical layer, the data link layer, the network layer, the transport layer, the session layer, the presentation layer, and the application layer. The OSI model was created at a time when network computing was in its infancy. It was published in 1984 by the ISO, and though it does not always map directly to specific systems, the OSI model is still used to this day as means to describe network architecture. So the first layer we'll look at is the physical layer. The physical layer is the lowest layer of the OSI model, and it is concerned with electrically and optically transmitting raw and structured data bits across the network from the physical layer of the sending device to the physical layer of the receiving device. It can include specifications such as voltages, pin layout, cabling, and radio frequencies. At the physical layer, one might find physical resources such as network hubs, cabling, repeaters, network adapters, or modems. The second layer of the OSI model is the data link layer. At the data link layer, directly connected nodes are used to perform node-to-node -node data transfer where the data is packaged into frames. The data link layer also corrects errors that may have occurred at the physical layer. The data link layer encompasses two sub-layers on its own. The first, Media Access Control, also known as MAC Address, provides flow control and multiplexing for device transmissions over a network. The second, the Logical Link Control, also known as LOC, provides flow and air control over the physical medium as well as the identifies line protocols. The third layer of the OSI model is the network layer. The network layer is responsible for receiving frames from the data link layer and delivering them to their intended destinations based on the addresses contained inside the frame. The network layer finds the destination by using logical addresses such as IP addresses or internet protocol. At this layer, routers are crucial components used to quite literally route information from where it needs to go between networks. The fourth layer of the OSI model is the transport layer. The transport layer manages the delivery and error checking of data packets. It regulates the size, sequencing, and ultimately the transfer of data between systems and hosts. One of the most common examples of the transport layer is TCP, or the Transmission Control Protocol. The fifth layer of the OSI model is the session layer. The session layer controls the conversations between different computers. A session or connection between machines is set up and managed at layer 5. Session layers services also include authentication and reconnections. The sixth layer is the presentation layer. The presentation layer formats or translates data for the application layer based on syntax or semantics that the application accepts. Because of this, it is at times also called the syntax layer. This layer can also handle the encryption and decryption required by the application layer. The seventh layer is the application layer. At this layer, both the end user and the application layer interact directly with the software application. This layer sees network services provided to end user applications such as web browsers or Office 365. The application layer identifies communication partners, resource availability, and synchronizes communication. So next, let's look at common network devices. Network devices include firewalls, switches, routers, and gateways. Firewalls are essential tools in managing and controlling traffic. A firewall is a network device used to filter traffic. Switches repeat traffic only out of the port at which the destination is known to exist. Switches offer greatest efficiency for traffic delivery, create separate collision domains, and improve the overall throughput of data. They usually occur on the OSI model later too. Routers are used to control traffic flow on networks and are often used to connect similar networks and traffic flow between the two. 
They can function using statically defined routing tables, or they can employ a dynamic routing system. They occur on layer three. A gateway connects networks that are used differently for network protocols. They're also known as protocol translators. Can be standalone hardware devices or a software device. Network gateways also work at layer three. Some other common network devices are repeaters, concentrators, amplifiers, bridges, hubs, and LAN extenders. Repeaters, concentrators, and amplifiers are used to strengthen the communication signal over a cable segment as well as connect network segments that use the same protocol. These all take place at layer one. Bridges are used to connect two networks, even networks of different topologies, cabling types, and speeds in order to connect network segments that use the same protocol. Bridges take place at layer two. Hubs were used to connect multiple systems and connect network segments that use the same protocol. A hub is a multi-port repeater. Hubs operate at OSI layer one. The LAN extenders are a remote access multi-layer switch used to connect distant networks over a WAN link. Network devices include LAN and WAN technologies, also known as local area network technologies and wide area network technologies. WAN connections and communication links can include private circuit technologies and packet switching technologies. Private circuit technologies use dedicated physical circuits. Private circuit technologies also use dedicated or lease lines, PPP or point-to-point -point protocol, SLIP or serial line internet protocol, ISDN or integrated services digital network, and DSL, which stands for digital subscriber line. Packet switching technologies use virtual circuits instead of dedicated physical circuits. This is more efficient and cost effective. Packet switching technologies include X.25 frame relay, asynchronous transfer mode, also known as ATM, synchronous data link control, also known as SDLC, and high level data link control, also known as HDLC. So next, let's go over the types of firewalls. These include static packet filtering firewalls, application level gateway firewalls, and circuit level gateway firewalls. Static packet filtering firewalls filter traffic by examining data from a message header. Application level gateway firewalls use a mechanism that copies packets from one network into another. They then change the source and destination addresses to protect identity of internal or private networks. Circuit level gateway firewalls are used to establish communication sessions between trusted partners. They operate at the session layer or layer five of the OSI model. Some other types of firewalls include stateful inspection firewalls, deep packet inspection firewalls, and next generation firewalls. Stateful inspection firewalls evaluate the state or the context of network traffic. Deep packet inspection firewalls use a filtering mechanism that operates typically at the application layer in order to filter the payload contents of a communication rather than only on the header values. Next generation firewalls is a multifunction device composed of several security features in addition to a firewall. These include IDS, IPS, TLS SSL proxies, web filtering, QoS, MGMT, bandwidth throttling, NAT, VPN anchoring, and antiviruses. Next, let's talk the difference between stateless and stateful firewalls. Stateless firewalls watch network traffic and restrict or block packets based on source and destination addresses or other static values. They are not aware of traffic patterns or data flows. They also typically are faster and perform better under heavier traffic loads. Stateful firewalls can watch traffic streams from end to end. They are aware of communication paths and can implement various IP security functions such as tunnels and encryption. They are also better at identifying unauthorized and or forged communications. Next, let's talk intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. 
Intrusion detection systems analyze whole packets, both header and payload, looking for known events. When a known event is detected, a log message is generated. Intrusion prevention systems analyze whole packets, both header and payload, looking for known events. When a known event is detected, packets are rejected. Next, let's go over the types of IDS systems. These include behavior-based and knowledge-based. Behavior-based creates a baseline of activity to identify normal behavior and then measures system performance against the baseline to detect abnormal behavior. This type of IDS system can detect previously unknown attack methods. Knowledge base uses signatures similar to the signature definitions used by anti-malware software. It is only effective against known attack methods. Both host-based and network-based systems can be knowledge-based, behavior-based, or a combination of both. So the first network attacks we'll go over are denial of service and distributed denial of service. A denial of service attack floods a server with traffic, making a website or resource unavailable. A distributed denial of service attack is a denial of service attack that uses multiple computers or machines to flood a targeted resource. Both types of attacks overload a server or web application with the main goal of interrupting services. The principal difference between DOS and DDOS is that the former is a system-on-system -system attack, while the latter involves several systems attacking a single system. There are five main differences between DOS and DDoS attacks. One, ease of detection. Two, speed of attack. Three, traffic volume. Four, manner of execution. And five, tracing of source. With ease of detection, since a DOS comes from a single location, it is easier to detect its origin and sever the connection. In fact, a proficient firewall can do this. On the other hand, a DDoS attack comes from multiple remote locations, disguising its origin. With the speed of attack, because a DDoS comes from multiple locations, it can be deployed much faster than a DOS attack that originates from one. The increased speed of attack makes detecting it more difficult, meaning increased damage, or even catastrophic outcome. With traffic volume, a DDoS attack employs multiple remote machines which means it can send much larger amounts of traffic from various locations simultaneously. This overloads the server rapidly in a manner that eludes detection. With manner of execution, a DDoS attack coordinates multiple hosts infected with malware, creating a botnet managed by a command and control server. In contrast, a DOS attack typically uses a script or a tool to carry out an attack from a single machine. And lastly, with tracing a source, the use of a botnet in a DDoS attack means the tracing the actual origin is much more complicated than tracing the origin of a DOS attack. Countermeasures for DOS and DDoS attacks include firewalls, routers, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, disabling broadcast packets from entering and leaving, and disabling echo replies. Botnets, controllers, and bot herders represent significant threats due to the massive number of computers that can launch attacks. Botnets are a collection of compromised computing devices, often called bots or zombies. Bot herders are criminals who use a command and control server to remotely control the zombies often use the botnet to launch attacks on other systems or to send spam or phishing emails. Denial of service attacks can take many forms and be used for various means. It can be to make a company lose business, to cripple a competitor, to distract from other attacks, or simply to cause trouble or make a statement. Denial of service attacks prevent a system from responding to legitimate questions for service. Common denial of service attacks include sin flood attack, smurf attack, and ping of death attack. Sin flood attacks disrupt the TCP three-way handshake. Smurf attacks employ an amplification network to send numerous response packets to a victim. And ping of death attacks 
send numerous oversized pink packets to the victim, causing the victim to freeze, crash, or reboot. Some more common types of denial of service attacks. So when dealing with network attacks, it is very, very important to know the order of the three-way handshake. It comes up commonly in discussions of TCP IP based network attacks. For example, the SynFLED attack exploits the TCP three-way handshake as follows. The attacker floods a victim site with SYN packets. The victim then responds to each SYN packet with a SYN ACT packet. The attacker does not respond with the last portion of the handshake and act packet, leaving the victim waiting for a response. Then the attacker continues to send the victim SYN frames with a spoofed address. The victim then continues to attempt sessions with the attacker allocating resources to accommodate each of these inbound session requests. So many resources are allocated that the victim cannot process a legitimate inbound request for a TCP IP session. Another type of network attack is called eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is simply listening to communication traffic for the purpose of duplicating it and or extracting confidential information. It's difficult to detect because it's a passive attack. Some countermeasures for this is to maintain physical access security, encryption in transit, and one-time authentication methods. Another type of network attack is impersonation or masquerading. This is the act of pretending to be someone or something you are not to gain unauthorized access to a network or system. Impersonation attacks also usually imply that authentication credentials have been stolen or falsified in order to bypass authentication mechanisms. Some countermeasures to stop this attack are one-time pads, token authentication systems, encrypting traffic, and employee awareness training. Some other type of network attacks are DNS attacks. DNS attacks include DNS poisoning and DNS spoofing. DNS poisoning is when an attacker alters the domain name to IP address mappings in a DNS system. They may redirect traffic to a rogue system or perform denial of service against that system. DNS spoofing is when an attacker sends false replies to a requesting system, beating the real reply from a valid DNS server. Some countermeasures for these attacks include allow only authorized changes to the DNS, restrict zone transfers, verify forwarders, and all log privileged DNS activities. Another type of DNS attack is a homograph attack. A homograph attack leverages similarities in character sets to register phony international domain names, also called IDNs, that appear legitimate to the naked eye. A way to mitigate this risk is to update your browser regularly. Also on the client side, modern browsers that use puny code can stop it. On the server side, use policies implemented by ICANN. Another form of a network attack is hyperlink spoofing. Hyperlink spoofing is very similar to DNS spoofing, 
It can take the form of DNS spoofing or just simply be an alteration of the hyperlink URLs. It's usually successful because people just Okay, let's talk about Windows. 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 Let's talk about Windows.
If you're ever typing something into the shell and it seems to be treating what you're saying in a weird way, all you usually need to do is to put single quotes around it. Ah, there we go. That's a little bit less repetitive. You've seen how many shells can have the of a file or 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 a file
Traditional computer networks were designed and operated as a set of individual components and services. This traditional structure was used regardless of whether the networking domain was a service provider wide area network or an enterprise data center. Using a traditional approach to network operations, new customer services are implemented using manual processes, often using a device level CLI. Implementing new types of network services requires installation of new equipment and connections. Many of today's networks lack the flexibility and scalability required to run modern applications. This means network operations become a bottleneck as new applications and services are brought online and the network grows larger and more complex. Traditional network operations also rely on manual failure remediation processes that increase service downtime and negatively impact the customers. Changes to the way modern applications run require the network to keep pace. To deploy applications at scale, network and service configuration must be automated. Applications running in virtualized environments, such as private, public, and hybrid clouds, require networking to be virtualized as well. Instead of deploying and managing physical hardware devices, software-based virtual switches, routers, and firewalls are used. Modern networks are also able to dynamically adjust and optimize traffic flow based on the analysis of network telemetry and data. An IP address is a numeric address. It's an identifier for a computer or device on a network. Every device has to have an IP address for communication purposes. The IP address consists of two parts. The first part is the network address, and the second part is the host address. There are also two types of IP addresses. The first one is the most common one, it's called IP version 4, and the second type is IP version 6. IP version 4 is the current version of IP addresses. It's a 32-bit numeric address written as four numbers separated by periods. Each group of numbers that are separated by periods is called an octet. The number range in each octet is 0 to 255. This address version can produce over 4 billion unique addresses. In the world of computers and networks, this IP address in this format here is meaningless. Computers and networks don't read IP addresses in this standard numeric format, and that's because they only understand numbers in a binary format. A binary format is a number that only uses ones and zeros. The binary number for this IP address is this number shown here. This binary number is what computers and networking devices actually read. So the question is, how do we get this binary number from this IP address? IP address four is made up of four sets of eight binary bits. And these sets are called octets. The bits in each octet are represented by a number. So starting from the left, the first bit has a value of 128, then 64, then 32, and so on, all the way down to 1. Each bit on the octet can be either a 1 or a 0. If the number is a 1, then the number that it represents counts. If the number is a 0, then the number that it represents does not count. So, by manipulating the ones and the zeros in the octet, 
you can come up with a range from 0 to 255. So for example, the first octet in this IP address is 66. So how do we get a binary number out of 66? First, you look at the octet chart, and you would put ones under the numbers that would add up to the total of 66. So you would put a 1 in the 64 slot. So now you already have 64, so we need two more. So let's put a number 1 in the 2 slot. So now if we count all the numbers that we have 1s underneath them, you would get a total of 66. All of the other bits would be zeros, because we don't need to count them since we already have our number. So this number here is the binary bit version of 66. So we'll put that number down here. So let's do the next number, which is 94. So let's put a 1 under 64, 16, 8, 4, and 2. So if we were to add all the numbers that we have 1s underneath them, we would get a total of 94. And since we don't want to count any of the other numbers, we just put zeros under the rest. So the next number is 29. So let's put a 1 under 16, 8, 4, and 1. And when you add all the numbers up, you get 29. And our last number is 13. So let's select 8, 4, 1. And when you add those up, you get 13. When the internet was first developed, programmers didn't realize how big it would become. They thought that IP version 4, which produced over 4 billion addresses, would be enough. But they were wrong. IP version 6 is the next generation of IP addresses. The main difference between IP version 4 and IP version 6 is the length of the address. The IP version 4 address is a 32-bit numeric address, whereas IP version 6 is a 128-bit hexadecimal address. Hexadecimal uses both numbers and alphabets in the address. So with this type of address, IP version 6 can produce an unbelievable 340 undecillion IP addresses. That's the number 340 with 36 digits after it. So as you might have guessed, IP version 6 is more than enough for the foreseeable future. So as stated before, IP version 6 is a 128-bit hexadecimal address. It's made up of 8 sets of 16 bits, with the 8 sets separated by colons, as you can see here. So in a similar way that we converted an IP version 4 address to a binary number, this is how we convert a binary number to a hexadecimal address. In an IP version 6 IP address, each hexadecimal character represents 4 bits. So we have to convert 4 bits at a time to get one hexadecimal character. So starting from the beginning, we convert the first four bits and put those bits up there against our four bit chart, which includes an 8, 4, 2, and a 1. So if we count the numbers that we have 1s underneath them, you wind up with a 2. So a 2 is the first hexadecimal character in this IP version 6 address. So let's do the next four bits and put those under our four bit chart. So if we count all the numbers that we have ones underneath them, we have a four and a two. And if we add those up, we get six. So a six is the second hexadecimal character in this IP address. So let's do our next set of four bits. And if we add all the numbers, that we have 1s underneath them, we get a total of 13. 
But the problem is, since 13 is a double digit number, we cannot use a double digit number to represent 4 bits. And that's because in a hexadecimal format, double digit numbers have to be represented with a single alphabet, which is A through F. So in this case, we have to use another chart for any 4 bits that the sum is 10 or higher. So in this chart up here, if the sum was 10, then we would use the letter A. Or if the sum was 11, then we would use a B. But in this case, our sum is 13. So now for the third character in our binary number, we would put a D. So in our last example, let's do the fourth set of bits. And if we add those up, we get 11. So we have a double digit character again, which means that we have to convert it to a single character alphabet. So if we look at our chart up here, 11 converts to a B. So the first 16 bits of this binary I. Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about the different wireless security methods and protocols that are used in wireless networks. Now, most of us have connected to a Wi-Fi network with our laptop, tablet, or even our smartphone. And to join that network with our device, you had to select the network name and you had to supply a password. Now, Wi-Fi networks can be just open with no password required. So that means that anybody can join it. However, in the majority of cases, Wi-Fi networks will be secure and will require a password. Now, there are several different protocols that are used for securing a Wi-Fi network. So let's start with a secure protocol called WEP. WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy, was developed in 1999, and it's the earliest security protocol that was used for wireless networks. And also, as its name implies, it's meant to supply the same security to wireless networks as it did for wired networks. However, this turned out not to be the case because after a time, it was found out that the 40-bit encryption key that WEP used was vulnerable and not secure, and therefore it was easily hackable. So that's why today WEP is no longer used and modern Wi-Fi routers won't even have it as an option anymore. So a better security protocol was needed for wireless networks. And that brings us to WPA. WPA, or Wi-Fi Protected Access, is another wireless security protocol that was developed to solve the problems of WEP. WPA is far better than WEP, and this is because it uses a stronger encryption method called TKIP, which stands for Temporal Key Integrity Protocol and TKIP dynamically changes its keys as it's being used, and this ensures data integrity. But even though WPA is more secure than WEP, even today WPA is outdated because TKIP did have some vulnerabilities. And that brings us to WPA2. WPA2 was developed to provide even stronger security than WPA. And it does this by requiring the use of a stronger encryption method. While WPA uses TKIP for encryption, which is known to have some limitations, WPA2 uses AES, which stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. AES uses a symmetric encryption algorithm, which makes it strong enough to resist a brute force attack. In fact, AES is so secure that the U.S. federal government has adopted it and is now using it to encrypt sensitive government data. Now, when you log into the Wi-Fi Router's configuration page and you go into the Wi-Fi Security section, this is where you would find the different security protocols that you can choose from to protect your Wi-Fi network. So here is an example from an older Linksys router. And here you can see the WEP, WPA, and WPA2 protocols that we discussed. Now, as I said, this router is a few years old and it still has WEP as an option. However, newer routers like this one here 
won't even have WEP as an option because WEP is weak and outdated and is no longer used. And thank God for that because it was garbage. Now you will also notice that on both of these routers, there's an option that has both WPA and WPA2. And this is a mixed security option. This option enables WPA and WPA2 at the same time. So it'll use both TKIP and AES security. Now the reason for this option is for compatibility purposes. Because some older devices, like prior to 2006, may not be compatible with using AES encryption that's used with WPA2. And so these older devices will connect to the older WPA protocol. But at the same time, modern devices will connect to WPA2. Now some people might ask, why not just choose the mixed option all the time, since it's the most compatible with all devices? Well, you can do this, but the problem is, is that in addition to using AES, it's also using TKIP. And since TKIP is not as strong as AES, you're leaving your network more vulnerable to a breach. However, if all of your devices are modern, then the best option is to choose WPA2, which only uses AES. Now, the next generation of wireless security is WPA3. WPA3 was introduced in 2018, and according to the official Wi-Fi website, wifi.org, WPA3 provides cutting-edge security protocols to the market. It adds new features to simplify Wi-Fi security and enable more robust authentication. And it will receive increased protections from password guessing attempts. Now, WPA3 won't be available on every Wi-Fi router that you purchase today because it was just introduced last year. However, you will start to see it more and more on Wi-Fi products in the next few months. Now, so far we discussed a few password protected security protocols, but there is another wireless security method that doesn't require you to type in a password. And this method is called WPS. WPS stands for Wi-Fi Protected Setup, and WPS was designed for people who know little about wireless networks to make it as easy as possible for their devices to join a wireless network. So here is a WPS configuration page for our router, and there are a couple of different methods that are used with WPS, but by far the most common method is the push button method. So with this method, you would just press a couple of buttons and then you'll be connected. So for example, most routers today will have a physical WPS button that you can press. And a lot of Wi-Fi printers will also have a software or physical WPS button. So let's say you wanted to connect this wireless printer to your Wi-Fi network. So you would press the WPS button on your Wi-Fi router and within two minutes, you would press the WPS button on your printer. And then your printer would connect to the Wi-Fi router in a few seconds. And that's really as simple as it gets. And you can also use method two if you want, if your client has a WPS PIN number. So you would just enter that PIN number into the field below, and within a few seconds, it'll connect. So as stated before, WPS is the easiest way to join a wireless network. And a lot of manufacturers have built their wireless products with WPS. And this is to make it as simple as possible for their customers to join their device to a wireless network. Now there's one more method we need to talk about, and this is called the access control. Or in some routers, it's called the MAC filter. And with this option, you can either allow or block devices from joining your network. Every network adapter has a MAC address. A MAC address is a hexadecimal number that uniquely identifies each device on a network. And with access control, you can either allow or block access by using the device's MAC address. When a device is blocked, it would only be able to get an IP address from your router but it won't be able to communicate with any other device. And it would not be able to connect to the internet. So the access control is just an extra layer of security that's in addition to your Wi-Fi password. And the access control is also for wired devices. In the world of networking, 
Computers don't go by names like humans do. They go by numbers. Because that's how computers and other similar devices talk and identify with each other over a network, which is by using numbers such as IP addresses. Humans, on the other hand, are accustomed to using names instead of numbers. Whether it's talking directly to another person or identifying a country, place, or thing, humans identify with names instead of numbers. So in order to bridge the communication gap between computers and humans and make the communication a lot easier, networking engineers developed DNS. And DNS stands for Domain Name System. And DNS resolves names to numbers. To be more specific, it resolves domain names to IP addresses. So if you type in a web address in your web browser, DNS will resolve the name to a number because the only thing computers know are numbers. So for example, if you wanted to go to a certain website, you would open up your web browser and type in the domain name of that website. So for example, let's use yahoo.com. Now technically, you really don't have to type in yahoo.com to retrieve the Yahoo web page. You can just type in the IP address instead if you already knew what the IP address was. But since we are not accustomed to memorizing and dealing with numbers, especially when there are millions of websites on the internet, we can just type in the domain name instead and let DNS convert it to an IP address for us. So back to our example, when you type in yahoo.com in your web browser, the DNS server will search through its database to find a matching IP address for that domain name. And when it finds it, it will resolve that domain name to the IP address of the Yahoo website. And once that is done, then your computer is able to communicate with the Yahoo web server and retrieve the web page. So DNS basically works like a phone book. When you want to find a number, you don't look up the number first. You look up the name first, then it will give you the number. So to break this down into further detail, let's examine the steps that DNS takes. So when you type in yahoo.com in your web browser, and if your web browser or operating system can't find the IP address in its own cache memory, it will send the query to the next level to what is called the Resolver Server. The Resolver Server is basically your ISP or Internet Service Provider. So when the Resolver receives the query, it will check its own cache memory to find an IP address for yahoo.com. And if it can't find it, it will send the query to the next level, which is the root server. The root servers are the top or the root of a DNS hierarchy. There are 13 sets of these root servers, and they are strategically placed around the world, and they are operated by 12 different organizations. And each set of these root servers has their own unique IP address. So when the root server receives the query for the IP address for yahoo.com, the root server is not going to know what the IP address is. But the root server does know where to send the resolver to help it find the IP address. So the root server will direct the resolver to the TLD or top level domain server for the .com domain. So the resolver will now ask the TLD server for the IP address for yahoo.com. The top level domain server stores the address information for top level domains such as .com, .net, .org, and so on. This particular TLD server manages the .com domain, which yahoo.com is a part of. So when the TLD server receives the query for the IP address for yahoo.com, the TLD server is not going to know what the IP address is for yahoo.com. So the TLD will direct the resolver to the next and final level which are the authoritative name servers. So once again, the resolver will now ask the authoritative name server for the IP address for yahoo.com. The authoritative name server or servers are responsible for knowing everything about the domain, 
which includes the IP address. They are the final authority. So when the authoritative name server receives the query from the resolver, the name server will respond with the IP address for yahoo.com. And finally, the resolver will tell your computer the IP address for yahoo.com and then your computer can now retrieve the Yahoo web page. It's important to note that once the resolver receives the IP address, it will store it in its cache memory in case it receives another query for yahoo.com so it doesn't have to go through all those steps again. Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about DHCP, or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, every computer or device on a network has to have an IP address for communication purposes. An IP address is an identifier for a computer or device on a network. And there are two ways that a computer can be assigned an IP address. It could be done by using a static IP or a dynamic IP. Now, a static IP is where a user assigns a computer or device with an IP address manually. Now, this was the original method that was done in the beginning of networking. So, for each computer on a network, you had to open up the computer's network configuration page and manually type in an IP address. But in addition to an IP address, you also had to type in a subnet mask, default gateway, and a DNS server. And anytime that you wanted to add another computer or device to the network, you had to do the same thing. So as you might have guessed, this could be a lot of work, especially if you were dealing with a large network that has a lot of computers. And you also had to make sure that all the IP addresses are unique because if you assign the same IP address twice, it would cause an IP conflict and would cause those computers to not have access to the network. But there is a better and easier way to assign a computer an IP address. And this is called a dynamic IP. A dynamic IP is where a computer gets an IP address automatically from a DHCP server. A DHCP server automatically assigns a computer with an IP address. And in addition to an IP address, it can also assign a subnet mask, default gateway, and a DNS server. So as an example, here we have the Network Connection Properties window open for the network interface card on a Microsoft Windows computer. And as you can see here, this computer is set to obtain an IP address automatically. So when you choose this option, the computer would broadcast a request for an IP address on the network. Then the DHCP server will assign an IP address from its pool and deliver it to the computer. And then once that's done, you can verify all the different settings that the DHCP server has given your computer. And you can do this by opening up a command prompt on a Windows computer and then type in ipconfig space forward slash all and then press enter. So as you can see here, the DHCP is enabled on this computer, which means that it's getting its IP address from a DHCP server. And then you can see the IP address here, along with the subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS server. So all of these settings were given by the DHCP server. So as you can tell, dynamic IP addressing is the best choice because it's automatic and it makes managing a network a lot easier. Now, a DHCP server assigns IP addresses to computers on a network from its scope. And a scope is a range of IP addresses that a DHCP server can hand out. So as an example here, we see a scope of IP addresses on this server. So as you can see, the range starts with this IP address and ends with this IP address. So computers on this network 
will get an IP address from this range of IP addresses. So this scope can give out 100 IP addresses. Now these values can be customized to either increasing or decreasing the range. It all depends on what the network administrator wants to do. So it is customizable. Now when computers obtain an IP address from a DHCP server, the server assigns the IP address as a lease. So the computer doesn't actually own the IP address. It's actually a lease. And a lease is the amount of time an IP address is assigned to a computer. For example, the lease could be for one day. Now the reason for the lease is to help make sure that the DHCP server does not run out of IP addresses in its scope. So as a demonstration, let's just say that this DHCP scope only has a range of three IP addresses. So it can only give out three IP addresses. Now obviously this is not very realistic because no network administrator is going to create a scope this small. But for this demonstration, let's just use this as an example. So let's go ahead and add three computers to this network. And as they are added, the DHCP server is going to assign them an IP address. So in this example, let's just say that the IP addresses are actually given to the computers and are not leased. So the DHCP has reached its limit on giving out IP addresses. All of its IP addresses are currently being used. But what happens if one of these computers is removed from the network? So if a computer is removed, it takes the IP address that it has been given with it. So let's say another computer gets added to the network. But the problem is the computer won't be able to access the network because the DHCP server has run out of IP addresses. So even though this computer here has been removed, it's still occupying an IP address that could be used for another computer. So this is why IP addresses are leased and are not given. Because if the IP addresses are leased, then this will tell the DHCP server which IP addresses are still being used and which ones are not being used. So in this example, the IP addresses are leased. So after a certain period of time during the lease, the computers will send a signal to the DHCP server asking the server to renew its lease of the IP address. So in other words, it's informing the DHCP server that it's still present on the network and its IP address is still being used. So if a computer is removed from the network, that computer is not going to be able to ask the DHCP server for a renewal. And if it doesn't ask for a renewal, then the lease will expire and then the IP address will go back to the IP address pool. So now the IP address can be used for another computer. And this is why IP addresses are leased. Now if you wanted a computer or device on your network to have a specific IP address all the time, in other words, you never want that IP address to change, well you can create a reservation on the DHCP server. A reservation ensures that a specific computer or device identified by its MAC address will always be given the same IP address when that computer or device requests an IP address from the DHCP server. So for example, on this DHCP server, if I create a reservation for my computer, the DHCP server will recognize my MAC address and will always give me this specific IP address. Now, reservations are not typically given to regular computers. They are typically given to special devices or computers such as network printers, servers, routers, etc. Because devices like these should be given the same IP address constantly. Now one final thing to note about DHCP. 
is that DHCP is a service that runs on a server. For example, this could be a Microsoft server or a Linux server. But it's also a service that runs on many routers also. Whether the router is a business router or a small office, home office router, these routers will have a DHCP service built into them.